Some of you here tonight may sense a strange feeling of deja vu about what we are doing at this conference. You may be reminded of another conference held last summer, excuse me, five summers ago, just down the road in Springville. This is the one that Mauro Proposi uh, mentioned today. That conference, which was held at the Art Museum, was also convened in Richard Bushman's honor. He was turning 80. It seemed like the right time to honor his long and productive career. In fact, it seemed past time. Now Richard is turning 85, and we honor him, him again. Now Richard, <laughs> what have you done in the past five years to warrant another conference? <laughs> I pose that as a question. I've made a short list of famous historians who were never honored with two academic conferences during their lifetimes. <laughs> Wilford Woodruff, Homer, Fawn Brody. <laughs> if Newell Bringhurst were here, he would want to hold more than two conferences. B.H. Um, Roberts, Herodotus, <laughs> Doris Kearns Goodwin, Joseph Fielding Smith. We won't analyze why the academics did not hold conferences in his name. Leonard Arrington and Aristotle. <laughs> now that's pretty good company. What does it say about Richard that we would want to celebrate his life and achievement not once but twice? Today, Bob Goldberg called him a rabbi. What kind of person is this? Is he one of the three Nephites? <laughs> Years ago, the philosopher Isaiah Berlin wrote a somewhat whimsical essay in which he divided writers and thinkers into two camps, the foxes and the hedgehogs. The categories came from a fragment of ancient Greek poetry. A fox knows many things, but a hedgehog knows one thing, one big thing. Hedgehogs tend to be big picture people. They see the world through a single overarching idea and everything else gets funneled into that idea. They are often visionaries or mystics. They don't get too hung up on the details. They are more concerned with what the details suggest or how the details fit into some grand theory or vision. Foxes, on the other hand, know many things. They have a sharp eye for detail, just like the fox does. They are novelists who can paint vivid pictures about many different characters. They are interested in so many things that they don't mind moving from one project to another with an equal degree of felicity and fascination. If the hedgehog glories in the oneness of life, the fox glories in its multiplicity. The question is, is Richard Bushman a hedgehog or is he a fox? Like a number of us in this room tonight, I first got to know Richard on a personal level through the summer fellowship program sponsored by the Joseph Fielding Smith Institute for Latter-day Saint History. At the encouragement of the Institute's director, Ron Esplin, <clears throat> Richard had started working on a cultural biography of Joseph Smith. The fellows spent six weeks of their summer with Richard and wrote a paper uh, on some topic that would help him, uh, often on a, the intersection of the culture and Joseph Smith's life. Meanwhile, during this research phase, Richard produced papers of his own. In 2001, the Institute convened a conference in Provo on the writing of Mormon biography, and Richard uh, delivered a paper surveying the biographies that had been written on Joseph Smith over the years. What intellectual or cult cultural work did they perform? What was their architecture? I happened to be in attendance at this conference. I was in between graduate programs and was then editing Mormon history articles for BYU Studies, which is now called BYU Studies Quarterly. I thought Richard's paper was tremendous, and having worked with him several years, years before in the Summer Fellowship Program, I figured that it would not be too presumptuous of me to walk up and ask if he would consider submitting his paper for publication at BYU Studies. 
At a reception in the Clyde Building, which is the engineering building, I have no idea why we held the reception there. <clears throat> Following the conference, I popped the question, but Richard turned me down. The paper would take a lot of work, he said, and it doesn't have any footnotes. I now believe that the hedgehog in Richard accounts for his response. He had been so focused on the one big idea in this paper that he wasn't at all interested in writing footnotes. That would be a distraction. The paper showed that all the attempts to tell Joseph Smith's life, both in the unbelieving and the believing varieties, had revolved around a single question, does God speak in the modern age? Richard had been so wrapped up in his one big idea that details like footnotes didn't matter. At that moment, though, when I had been rejected, a head popped into our conversation from over my shoulder. Richard, if you submit the paper, Jed will write the footnotes. <laughs> <coughs> it was Jack Welch, the editor-in-chief of BYU Studies. Jack, are you here? He's not here. Oh, he's in Jerusalem. OK, good excuse. That would have looked poorly on, on Jack's part. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't talked with Jack in advance of approaching Richard, but I didn't know that he was standing right behind me listening to our conversation. Because of that invitation from Jack, Richard submitted the paper. We wrote the footnotes to the article that was published as a Joseph Smith for the 21st century. A few months after that, Richard called me on the phone and offered me a job working on his biography. I owe my work on rough stone rolling to Jack Welch's eavesdropping, <laughs> and the fact that Richard is a hedgehog in his habits. My work with Richard spanned two summers and parts of several school years during my PhD program in history at the University of Wisconsin. As I read and critiqued Richard's draft chapters, I was surprised to see another side of him coming out. The chapters came with many footnotes already written, they also had much more primary source research than I ex ex expected to find from a hedgehog. Claudia once said that Richard writes his own books in an armchair. And what she means by that is that Richard thinks and thinks about his books and isn't too bothered with a lot of archival research before he gets writing. He's like Rodin's thinker. Once he figures out what the big idea is, he can line up the documents to support the big idea. But I found something quite different in the drafts. Richard had read a lot of primary sources, and his big ideas seemed to have emerged from his reading of them. It's like David Hall in that respect. He was a master at reading primary sources. He astutely attended to key words in the documents. He paid close attention to repetition. He noticed absence or uh, what the documents didn't say. His prose was vivid and precise and short. He was more like a fox. My most memorable encounter, encounter with Richard the Fox came during our second summer together. The Institute gave Richard an office in its headquarters in the Knight Mangum building, which is now a grassy field uh, south of campus. And he spent his days reading and writing at a small desk with blank walls. This was Jim Allen's office but Jim Allen was emeritus at that time. One afternoon, as I passed his office, he pulled me in. He was reading Ehat and Cook's Words of Joseph Smith and was excited to tell me that he had just found the title of his biography. Richard hadn't put too much pressure on himself to find a title for his book as a hedgehog might. For years, he was content to write draft chapters, each one independent of the other, each a beautiful ray of light in its own right without feeling the need to compress them all under an overarching thesis. He was near the end of Joseph's life before a title finally emerged. Richard handed me the book and asked me to read a paragraph from Thomas Bullock's account of the King Fala Discourse. See if you can spot the title, he asked playfully. I read and I was really hoping that I would not get the wrong title. I said, you never knew my heart? That's it, he said. Claudia was able to spot it immediately too, he said. And he asked for my reaction. I 
said, I like it, but you know, everyone is going to say that you are writing in response to Brody. The title of Fawn Brody's infamous biography happened to be in the very next sentence. Richard was not impressed with my comparison to Brody. <laughs> nah, he said, I left her in the dust years ago. <laughs> Richard eventually located a different title for the book. In multiple sermons given, given near the end of his life, Joseph Smith compared himself to a rough stone rolling down a mountain. As the stone gains momentum, its sides are chipped off, leaving a polished stone behind. Now, instead of people saying the book is a response to Brody, they say it is a response to Bob Dylan or the Rolling Stones. <laughs> <clears throat> My encounters with Richard Bushman help explain why we have assembled a second time to honor his life and work. We admire thinkers who, like Richard, find themselves possessed by big ideas, revelation, social order, character, republicanism, gentility, but we also admire people who write with grace and clarity and who display the sparkling range of interests and curiosity that Richard has displayed over the course of his academic career. It is a rare breed of human being who can pull off writing big books about the history of gentility in one moment and the history of farming in another. Richard has done it all as no Mormon historian has ever done it or intellectual. He is much more than a historian. He is a movement leader, a talking head, a public intellectual, a humble believer, a mentor, a counselor, a friend. He's the father of Mormon studies. He is at once the person we aspire to be and the person who reminds us of ourselves. He is both a hedgehog and a fox. And that must mean that five years from now, we will need another conference in Richard's honor. Thanks. There is another story behind the title, which indeed uh, I ran on to and thought worked. Um, rough stone rolling, which is words that were used by Joseph himself to a certain extent and by others. A few years ago, uh, Claudia and I took the opportunity, afforded once a year, to enter a New York building which ordinarily is not open to the public. It's the Masonic Hall. And in this 14-story building, there are maybe 15 different halls and lodges from all over the area meet. And we noticed as we went into one of these halls, and we're getting the sim symbolism explained, that on one of the alders, you sort of walk up a few steps to a chair where the Grand Master, whoever is presiding, sits, there was a big piece of rock sitting on one side of the altar on the steps. And on the other side was a round stone. And we asked the man, what does that stand for? He says, well, this is what pe men are like before they're masons, rough stones after they become smooth stones. So the book is really an advertisement for Freemasonry. <laughs> but it's worked. Wes, Wes Johnson and I had a debate. Should it be rough stone rolling, the biography of Joseph Smith, or should it be Joseph Smith, rough stone rolling? But the fact of the matter is it didn't make any difference because no one calls it Joseph Smith. Everyone calls it rough stone rolling. So. That's how it worked out. So my thanks to Jed for his uh, generosity tonight, but even more for his help on that book. I knew Jed is a person who knew everything about um, Joseph Smith in early church history. He's a fanatic in that regard, and he could be trusted to really dig up all the secondary work that was necessary to go into those notes. Also thanks to uh, Spencer, Jed, and, and Kathleen for putting this whole operation together and to Jerry Bradford for suggesting the idea of a 
Festschrift, and above all, thanks to all of you for coming. It really warms my heart to, to sense the friendship of so many people. When I was young and had published only one book, I used to dream of a funeral where people would talk of my scholarship in the presence of my children. Uh, um, if I was not to be around, I wanted them to know that their father had done some honorable work. So the idea of this symposium fulfills that dream because a number of my children are here tonight. Now all I need to do to complete the story is to pass from the scene myself. <laughs> At first, I had reservations about a festschrift that uh, had been voiced here. Grant Underwood had already organized a celebratory event at the American Historical Association, uh, finished off with a terrific reception afterwards. And as people have said, on my 80th birthday, there was a symposium <laughs> at the Springville Art Museum. So after those two events, I was beginning to feel more than a little overexposed, and I do want to make clear my intent in living so long is not to give people additional opportunities to plan another conference on my behalf. <laughs> but when Spencer, Jed, and Kathleen began putting plans together, I did see the possibilities. <clears throat> I've long been interested in how Mormons integrate exploit, elucidate, get around, or overcome their faith when writing and teaching. Ours is supposedly an encompassing religion. The word consecration plays a big part in Mormon worship. What would it mean to consecrate our scholarship? Is there any way we can integrate our personal religious lives and our work as scholars and teachers, does our belief, in short, make any difference in our scholarship? Sometimes I have dreamed that Mormonism can function as Marxism does in providing a set of issues and categories to be explored historically. What would be the Mormon equivalent of class or a, a hege hegemony? Do Mormons have a conception of human nature that would play out in history in some way? None of these lines of thought have gotten me very far. In an essay entitled uh, Faithful History that I think Phil referred to, um, I speculated on these possible approaches derived from scriptures and none of them really held up. I eventually decided that we will only know what a Mormon historiography will look like when Mormons write it. I could find no systematic approach for framework for historical issues. The best I can come up with is an attitude, which has been referred to here before as a Mormon attitude, toward the subjects of my historical inquiries, an impulse to take people on their own terms. At the conference uh, for my 80th birthday, Stuart Parker, who's been a member, who was part of one of the seminars, summer seminars, proposed that I practice a hermeneutics of generosity as contrasted to a hermeneutics of suspicion. I try, like most Mormons, I think, to think the best of people, to understand the world as they see it. I once told a graduate student, Lauren Winner, in a moment of candor that my belief in an afterlife affected my attitude toward historical subjects. I had to picture myself at some point talking face to face with people I write about. If my own deliberations, however, have not taken me very far, I was still interested in hearing what others would have to say. I thought it would be particularly delicious to have Mormons reflect on the interplay of their personal religious belief and their scholarship and teaching in the presence of non-Mormon scholars, 
not in the privacy of the Mormon ghetto, but before a sympathetic but questioning non-Mormon audience. That would be a useful exercise for everyone, for Mormons to state their perspectives in, a, in public academic language, and for non-Mormon scholars to seek understanding of a religious outlook that is somewhat unfamiliar. And so the project was launched. Spencer sent out the invitations. You accepted, and here we are. As it turned out, the um, exercise proved to be rewarding for me. Working up uh, comments for the occasion, I began to see my own experience in a new light. I discovered that my search for a Mormon attitude toward writing history was entangled with my personal search for faith, my own faith. The stories about my attitudes towards scholarship were actually stories about my personal religious convictions. I have told many times the story of how I lost my faith in God during my sophomore year at Harvard. By that time, I decided to declare history and science as my field of concentration. It was a tiny concentration newly put together by various people at Harvard, among them I.B. Cohen and Thomas Kuhn. At my request, Cohen took me on as a 2T if I would agree to read the things he was reading. Every few weeks, we got together for an hour to talk over what we'd read. Cohen took a kind of fatherly interest in me and at one point gave me some advice. Knowing my background, he observed that people around here, meaning Harvard, think Mormonism is garbage. It was not a malicious comment. He was simply trying to help me grow up. I was set back a little, but the observation was not news to me. I'd been hearing a lot about logical positivism, then current among undergraduates, and knew it left no room for religious belief. I knew my Mormonism seemed strange to about everyone, but I was not going to back away from my faith on the advice of a Harvard professor or at the behest of Bertrand Russell, the positivist. Cohen was challenge, challenging everything I stood for, my people, my family, my friends back in Portland where I grew up. I chose to hold on to my own past and so nothing in my belief changed at first. Looking back now, I see that I was not just encountering one professor or one philosophy or the intellectual culture at Harvard. I was encountering modernism itself with its skepticism about all things religious. I was glimpsing a world where, as Richard Rorty has said, the universe does not speak, only we speak. There's no friendly intelligence beyond our own, nothing like spirit or soul, no angels, no gold plates, no divinely inspired prophets, no one to hear our prayers. That was the modernist world I now was entering. As I've told the story for many years, the pressure of all these influences wore me down. By the end of my sophomore year, I had to admit that I was no longer sure about God. Religious agnosticism seemed like the only viable position given what we know for sure. Before this loss of faith, I'd been interviewed for a mission and was to enter the field in June. I carried through my commitment and left from New England, my assigned mission field, but I arrived without faith. When my mission president, J. Howard Mon, asked if I had a testimony, I told him no. I did not know there was a God or that any of the things that Mormons believed had actually happened or were true. Then, in the usual telling of the story, I go on to relate how during my first three months in the mission field, I wrestled with my doubts 
asked all the difficult questions about the witnesses, about Joseph Smith, about the Book of Mormon, and prayed the agnostic's prayer for light. When the mission president arrived for the first conference and I was asked to speak, speak, I said that at last I knew the Book of Mormon was right. End of story. That is the tale Mormons like to hear. Faith overcoming doubt and the doubter ending up in the right place. But I have always been troubled by one inconsistency in my story. If I was such a doubter, why did I go into the mission field where I would be called on to testify of my beliefs every day? At the time, I recognized there was a problem, but I did not fight with myself about going or not. I did not worry about being hypocritical or misleading people. I was upfront about my skepticism, but did not hesitate to go. No angst at all. How could that be? Not until a few years ago did I face up to this contradiction and reformulate the story. I have come to believe that in actuality, my problem was not faith, but finding the words to express my faith. The problem was that when Cohen said the Mor that Mormonism was garbage, I did not know what to say in return. I knew that the words, had been taught, the words that had been taught in Sunday school in my home would sound silly to him. I was left speechless. Harvard is all about talking. Much of the education takes place at the dinner table, where undergraduates yak on endlessly about everything. There was an unwritten rule that you could believe about anything, but you had to explain why. You did not need to persuade everyone, but you had to make sense. I needed a way to state my beliefs that would sound reasonable, even if they were more than a little weird. That was what I lacked at the end of my sophomore year. I had no critique of Bertrand Russell, no reply to Cohen, and no language about Mormonism that made sense over the dinner table. I think I believed all along through that year, why else the mission? but I was dumb, unable to speak. Over the years, what can be thought of as a growth in faith can also be thought of as an improvement in language. I have learned to speak in a way that can be understood in a secular, in secular time. There's nothing particularly clever or overpowering about this speech. It just comes out of a desire to translate belief for unbelievers. Soon after I arrived at Claremont, the man soon to be dean of religious studies there asked me to lunch. A Catholic himself, we no long sooner sat down than he blurted out, how can you believe in Joseph Smith? You're a scholar, how can you accept his fantastic story? I replied in one sentence, I find that when I live the Mormon way, I'm the kind of man I want to be. There was, that was anything but a noble defense. There was nothing deep or clever, but the words did the trick. Often I find the language only after there is an occasion to use it. At the time, I blurt out an awkward reply and only work out what I should have said later. My colleague, Ken Jackson, runs a lunch table for scholars at Columbia's Lehman Center. Soon after Rough Stone Rolling came out, he asked me to lead a discussion. I made some comments about Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, and then Andy Del Banco, the literary historian, asked what was my personal relationship to the Book of Mormon. It was a logical point of inquiry, and one I should have been able to answer in a second but I froze. I was obviously paralyzed, and Jackson had to come to my rescue by saying a few words about his own 
religious belief. The reason they froze was because Mormons know precisely what they should say when asked this question. They should bear testimony about the spirit revealing the truth of the Book of Mormon. The answer is prescribed. I froze because I knew that answer would not work. It would be like a lawyer defending the church in court. When asked why he knew the church was in the right in the case, it would not do to say it because he knew that this was the true church of God. A testimony of that kind would not work in a courtroom. It would weaken the lawyer's case rather than strengthening it. I felt the same way at the lunch table. Testimony was not the answer. The I know formulaic were not the right words. Later, I worked out another answer, the one I should have spoken. I could simply say that I read the Book of Mormon as informed Christians read the Bible. As I read, I know the arguments about the book's historicity, but I can't help feeling the words are true and that the events actually happen. I believe it in the face of many questions. Searching for the right words may seem like a simple and trivial response to the profound questions about religion coming out of modernism. Saying that living the Mormon way helps you be the kind of man I want to be does not begin to deal with the complexity of the modernist challenge. The reply may seem like a dodge, but I don't think the right words are trivial. They are not merely a gambit. Words are our entry into another culture. They are the way we make ourselves intelligible in a strange land. They not only allow us to connect, to make ourselves understood, they show respect. We're making an effort to communicate in a way that can be understood. If we insist on using standard church language, we are in effect declaring our indifference. We force people to learn our language in order to understand us. We don't go halfway. Out of this inquiry came questions about the, nat the nature of my faith. Was I really doubting during my sophomore year? Was I only lacking for words? I think that by nature, I am a believing person. It is the point of rest in, my, in the oscillations of my soul. But that faith may not take a workable form until I find the right words. I need to speak faith to make it real. One thing I know is that I could not have written Rough Stone Rolling without decades of practice in speaking my faith among my secular colleagues. Driven by circumstances, I've had to find a language that works in all circumstances. The book is not notable for its research. There are lots of people who know more about Joseph Smith than I do. What distinguishes the book is its tone. It is written in the, in the language that I began to learn at Harvard in the dining halls and in Cohen's tutorial. The learning continues down to this day, to this very moment, when we have collected to speak to one another about what we believe. After Cohen, the people in this room became my tutors. I learned to talk from some of them. These relationships go back a long way. As David said earlier, we've known each other since he was a senior in history and literature, and I, as a graduate student, sat in on his oral examination. David may not realize how much of an influence he has been. For about 10 years, we worked together on developing the American and New England Studies program at Boston University. We brought together local institutions like the Museum of Fine Arts and Old Sturbridge Village to help us investigate New England material culture. A lot of the funding came from the National Endowment for the Humanities. 
Jonathan Fairbanks, then curator of American art at the Museum of Fine Arts, said that David could press his hand on a blank sheet of paper and a grant application would appear. <laughs> what I learned from David is that you can make something out of almost nothing. The summer seminar and many of the other projects I've been involved in are really an outgrowth of what I learned from him during those Boston University years. Richard Brown and I came together through an early American history projects we were involved in. I took to him and his and lovely Irene right away. I had many times told a story in Richard that he may not remember. Years ago, when I was a bishop in Cambridge, I invited the Browns to come to dinner and meet the missionaries. I asked the missionaries to present a film strip on the granite vault in the church's record collection program. We were then working from town rec on town records that the church had microfilmed. I thought the story of Mormon record keeping would appeal to an early Americanist. When the missionaries arrived, they did not bring a granite vault film strip, but one on ancient America. <laughs> Lacking a script to match, to match the pictures, they asked me to narrate the story, <laughs> the strip. That out of the way, they asked if they could have a prayer. Richard agreed, but then they asked him to kneel. <laughs> and at that, he bridled. Next it was, do you believe in God? Richard drew himself up a little and said, if you were a person of age and wisdom, I might talk about my belief, but not here. <laughs> the meeting was a disaster. <laughs> but the strange thing is that the very broad-minded Browns seemed to tolerate the young men, and it didn't damage our friendship at all. To the contrary, whenever we meet, we talk candidly about the things that matter most to us, our children, and what's happening in our lives. And I think partly at least because I let the Browns see my Mormonism in the raw. <laughs> I first got to know Grant Wacker through a group of evangelical scholars that included Mark Knoll, Skip Stout, and Nathan Hatch. I felt a kinship because we were all believers making our way through a secular landscape. I did not realize how generous and kind Grant was until we spent a year at the National Humanities Center in North Carolina and he was teaching at Duke. <clears throat> he went out of his way to welcome us and give us a chance to talk to students. Since then, many things have bound us together. The strange thing is how a very small item formed my early impression of Grant. After a conference, a scholarly conference, I joined a group of evangelicals for dinner. I'm pretty sure Mark and Skip were, were there, and perhaps others. As we sat down to eat and our food was before us, Grant looked around at his colleagues and asked, what about grace, which we proceeded to offer right there in the restaurant. I remember that moment because it showed his belief had a little edge to it, which I always like. I first became acquainted with Laurie Maffley Kipp through Mormon studies students like Reen Nielsen, who flocked to UNC because she was so interested in Mormon topics herself. She and I have had an ongoing exchange over her review of Rustone Rowling for Books and Culture. In it, she said something about how modern scholars will make, take, not take the book seriously because it does not offer a material explanation of Joseph Smith. <laughs> For some reason, that comment stuck with me and I have brought it up in public various times when she was present. I think there's been a misunderstanding on my part. Laurie was not entirely speaking for herself, and I, I now realize, but for consensus of academic re readers and in a sense deploring the fact of material explanations. So for any undeserved barbs, Laurie, I hereby apologize and thank you for many valuable 
observations about Joseph Smith and Mormonism. For wisdom and good judgment, you can't beat Laurie. Not all of you will know that Ann Taves played a large role in establishing the Mormon Studies Program at Cla Claremont Graduate University. She taught American religion at the Claremont School of Tho Theology, a closely affiliated school, and masterminded the intellectual structure of the Mormon Studies Program. When she left for Santa Barbara, I took over the American Religion Program. Anne is working on a problem raised by Laurie Maffley Kipp. Laurie gave a talk on Joseph Smith's sincerity on a panel I chaired. Can we believe in the religious sincerity of a man who claimed he possessed gold plates but wouldn't show them to anyone who wanted to see them? Is there another way to approach Mormonism, Laurie asked, rather than going through this dis disruptive story? Anne has been trying to preserve Joseph Smith's sincerity by arguing there are ways of conceiving the plates that are religiously valid and not a form of fraud. He was not trying to deceive his followers about the plates. If the plates were not real in the usual sense, religiously they were. This is a bold and noble effort and indi an indication in my eyes of Anne's good w goodwill. I've known Bob Golder less time than any of the others, but I have heard of him many years before we met. Bob tells the story of driving in from the airport when he was being interviewed for a job at the University of Utah. As they passed the temple, uh, the driver, a uh, Utah faculty member, made some comment about the temple being a local version of Disneyland architecture. Bob was astonished at this cavalier treatment of a significant religious monument. He took the job and since then has taken on the task of mitigating, if not dispelling, the animosity between the church and the university's faculty, a divide that has prevailed for a long time. Only he knows the battles he fought, but he has successfully made Mormon scholars feel at home at the University of Utah and raised money for scholars in residence programs. The U, U has now become a venue where the best work on Mormon subjects can be presented and Mormons can be themselves. As for my comrades in Mormon studies, I can only take pride in all you have accomplished. When the Mormon History was, Association was formed in the mid 60s, there were only a handful of historians with PhDs. Now there are scores and scores in many humanistic and social science fields. Mormon studies and Mormon scholarship are thriving. We are all over the map in our interest, varied in our approaches to the issues raised in this symposium. We pursue our investigations idiosyncratically as I think we should. But I think I sense one common thing. I think we all feel some tension <clears throat> between our religious convictions and the secular times in which we live. In one way or another, modernism invades and unsettles our thinking. Perhaps our thinking about our fields, perhaps our thinking about our personal beliefs. What I hope we all realize and that this tension is not to be suppressed or regretted. Unanswerable as some questions are, we need not lament the discomfort they bring. The strain of believing in unbelieving times is not a handicap or a burden. It is a stimulus and a prod. It is precisely out of such strains that creative work issues forth. And we can take satisfaction in knowing that we are in this together. Thank you.